through we're gonna just go through mainly the um, last booklet today the um which is a fair amount of chapters but that gets us to the point where next week we have integration uh, and catch up. And so next week is a great time to have questions that aren't answered yet or, and what we're gonna do is we're just gonna do a, an extensive um, anatomy session uh, where, we, where we do sort of a practice quiz that's uh, uh, pretty extensive. Um, on that note, did you guys see the, uh, what is it? This one where I posted all the pictures uh, for the tests that I that I use on the test. Did you guys see that? Good. Yes. Okay, excellent. Let me make sure I just for the ones who haven't, let me just go through it real quick or for the recording. So if you are in the canvas, you could see my canvas, right? Yes. Where the heck is that? Oh, this, <clears throat> this is assignments that I have to grade. So all the way at the bottom, where we have test number three, review what I did there, I added pictures used on test three. So that's where that is now. And if you click on that, you get to a PDF and then you can just use that to study. I would suggest you to use those pictures to, to label the terms a few times for your test, you know, getting um, um, practicing for the test. But I put all the pictures there that I have, and I put one, this one I just cropped because I actually didn't take a picture. So we're gonna use that today during the quiz time. Good. So that is there. And then what I want you guys to do is take out your review sheet, the four pager there. And we went through page three, the census organs last time. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to do respiratory system, digestive system, and urinary system. The reproduction embryology, uh, I actually don't have on the review. I don't use those chapters in the tests, in those written questions. I use them in... Um, oh, wait, can you see me? You can see this. Can you see this? There we go. Uh, I, I, I use those mainly for the quiz because when I do the class in class, it's just so close to the test that it'd be kind of like, I feel like a little unfair. So that's why we're not having that on there, but we can uh, go through it if we want to. Um, but we start with the respiratory system. And so the main job of the lungs is to get us oxygen into the system. And so we need oxygen to make ATP, to make energy, to utilize the food that's the energy that's stuck in food and the glucose and all that. And with the oxygen uh, together, we can then attach the phosphate back to the ADP and make ATP out of it. So that's uh, very important. And then the other important function that we do is we get rid of gases waste uh, like CO2. So we, we breathe, so, so we bring oxygen into the system and we get rid of CO2 and also other wastes as well. And then the respiratory system is interesting because it helps with the acid and base balance. And the acid and base balance is, <clears throat> is, um, is very delicate because you don't want the blood to be too acidic. And so as soon as it gets a little too acidic and that's like a 7.25 or so, so it's very minimal in the range of what we wanna have. Um, <clears throat> We have bicarbonate ions in the system. So those are the buffering things. We talked briefly about that in the chemistry chapter. And those, the bicarbonate ions, pick up uh, excessive hydrogen ions, which is what gives us the acidity. And then so that they help. And then what happens is the bicarbonate ion goes through to the lungs. And there we breathe out the carbon dioxide and, and revert the bicarbonate ions back to carbonic acid, which can pick up more CO2. Uh, and so that's how then the respiratory system helps with uh, the pH balance. And I think that's important. I like this slide because then the renal system is uh, the third layer of where we can uh, keep our blood acidity level in check. And the renal system helps us with creating and making um, um, these bicarbonates. And then the buffy, the buffer is, is what then those chemicals pick up the um, hydrogen ions and neutralize the blood. So that's a pretty 
um, what I think is most important to understand there is just, just when we look at the acid and base balance, um, it's such a crucial, uh, and, and the acidity level in the blood, it's such a crucial element for us to keep that at a narrow range. We have multi-tiered ways of making sure of it and, and, and assuring that. And so first is in the blood, then the lungs, and then the kidneys. So that's for that slide. And then um, the next what I like you to understand is that in order to reach the body cells, atmospheric oxygen has to travel through air passages which and, and ventilating the lungs. So what that speaks to is that oxygen coming from the air has to go through the conducting passages bef to bring air into the lung. That's what's meant by ventilating the lungs. And conducting passages are basically passages where we don't have any oxygen exchange, which is these are passageways that brings the air to the deep sacs, the alveoli, and the lungs, and takes it back out after we um, harvest the oxygen from it. Um, and so that we call all of that the conducting zone. We have a, a, a or and we have an upper part of it, and we have a lower part of it. And the upper part of it is pretty much all the way the upper respiratory tract goes to the voice box. And then the lower respiratory tract is up below that, the trachea, the bronchi, and then inside the lungs. Um, and then from inside the deep spaces, and then the system, you know, we go through all the details with the passageways um, in the, the nose and then the pharynx and then the voice box. But let's go to the alveoli first here. Um, <clears throat> Where are we? Here we are. So then deep, deep inside the lungs, once we bring the air to it, we get to the respiratory zone and that's inside these air sacs and these air sacs are the alveoli and that's where the oxygen will diffuse from the air into these blood vessels that are hanging around here and, 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 and can, if they suck it right up. It kind of like it's diffusion. It goes from the concentration, higher concentration to lower concentration. So it goes straight through it. I think I might have a slide here that talks about, yeah, look at this. When you look at the diffusion rate, you see um, how the oxygen comes um, um, on the venous side, on the, on the low oxygen side here, the blue part of the vessel. And it has a 40 milligrams of mercury um, kind of density and then um, uh, saturation and then it comes here after it goes through the alveoli it has 104 and so that's a really big difference uh, in terms of how much oxygen is being picked up the carbon dioxide that's been brought out is not as drastic it's from 45 to 40 so that's not as drastic but that's um, the diffusion. It's, it's simply diffusion because there's more oxygen in the alveoli here and then it sucks it in because it wants to be balancing out. So that's that simple diffusion concept we talked about um, in the cell chapter. Okay, um, so that's that one. We briefly more talk about the upper versus the lower passageways, which there is a point there. We see that the upper passageways um, warm, humidify and purify the air. <clears throat> and we have most passageways can do those things because, well, you humidify and purify because we got goblet cells and they are um, they are kept keeping keeping the mucous membrane in the mouth and down the throat moist uh, because they secrete uh, mucus into the space and the mucus is kind of cool because the mucus um, uh, keeps it moist moistens the air but it also traps particles that we want to get rid of. And then we can basically, you know, cough them out. But we also have cilia that are on top of those cells in the trachea and the bronchi and actually all the way down deeper into the bronchi. And what they do is they, they whip. You know what? I'm not sure how far deep they go. The muscular layer goes quite deep. I know that. But the uh, cilia, I'm not sure if it stops at the main bronchi or goes to the segmentals. Uh, but anyway, what those do, those are cool because they, they whip in one direction. And what they do is they whip the material that's stuck in it out, out upward and outward. And so most of that gunk that, you know, that um, trapped 
stuff goes out, we can let it go, or we, you know, it's just swallow it and it goes to the digestive tract and nobody cares about it. Um, but that's what we have there. So that's the cilia on the mucus goblet cells, mucus membrane slash goblet cells. That is kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> I think it's kind of cool. And then from there, when we go down a little bit, we get to the place where we split from the upper to the lower passageways and we get to the uh, voice box. And the voice box is the larynx. And so that's the, when we look at the larynx, this is in situ here in the person. So the front here is like right there where the guys, you can see the Adam's apple and the ladies, you've got to push a little bit, uh, be, you know, before they, they don't have the voice change. Um, and so what you, what you poke on is the Adam's apple, that's the thyroid cartilage. And when we flip that, or well, well actually that's, the, that's big in the front, like the bow of a ship. And then when we go below there, we got a smaller little cartilage that's more like a ring in the front. That's called the cricoid cartilage. If you turn the whole thing around, we got the thyroid on top here. That's kind of open in the back, but the bottom one, the cricoid gets really thick in the back. And on top of those, we have these small little erythenoid cartilages that are uh, sort of stuck on processes that can rotate around, around their own axis here. Because what we have there, we have then the vocal cords and the vocal folds um, um, attached to it. The cords are the ones we worry about. Most of are these thin, stringy, guitar-like, guitar string-like thing structures that are um, cartilages. I mean, it's, no, it's collagen fibers mostly, I would think, um, that are attached to the erythenoid cartilage and then in the front they go to the thyroid cartilage. And as the, um, these processes, these erythenoid cartilages rotate around their own axis, muscles move them, the um, vocal cords either close up or open up. And so we can then, uh, 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 the tension um, will change and the air going past the tension will vibrate those cords and that's phonation. That's how we, that's how we, um, we, we make sounds. Um, so that's pretty cool, I think. So that's what you need to know there. And the other terminology there is the opening. This goes down to the trachea. The opening there, that's called the glottis. Um, and the different tension causes the different pitch. So the lower voices is the, the chords are not as taut. The higher voices, they're more taut. So that's what that is about. And so that's pretty cool, I think, how we make voice. And then the last, second to the last one, no, then the last point here is the serous membranes. Where's the serous membranes? Here we go. The serous membranes are really cool. We talked briefly about them in the heart um, and it's the pericardium in the heart. And so the, the serous membrane is, it's one continuous membrane that clings here to the heart and then it folds over and then it clings to the outside wall sort of, and then it comes back together. So it's kind of like you take a fist and put it in a balloon. So you've got two membranes, one right on the organ and one on the wall. And so you, you have one, it's called the visceral, that's the one on the organ, and one is called the parietal, that's the one on the wall. And so you got those membranes in the chest, in the heart, in the, in the, in the lungs, around the lungs, and then around the gut. In the heart, they give you this frictionless motion because it's a little fluid inside and that serious fluids makes, makes it like there's no friction. In the lungs, that's partly true too because you don't want the, the lungs to grind against the chest wall when we inhale. But the other thing that's really cool in the lungs is that because this membrane is continuous, we can create a suction with it. And so what happens is the parietal pleural, it's called the parietal pleural, here is, is attached to the chest wall on the inside and the visceral pleurum is attached to the lungs. And in between there is this space that's not really a physical space, it's a, it's a potential space and it has a, a, a liquid, watery liquid in it, that serous fluid. And it's kind of like that fluid holds those two layers together. And so that's the that's the suction. And so that's an in decreased in pressure, what we call that technically. And so that is really important because that keeps the lungs 
attached to the chest wall. And then when we inhale, the chest wall will expand and the diaphragm will go downward and this cavity gets bigger and that suctions air into the lungs. And that's what we call breathing. And so that's why that is a very important um, structure. You can see that in the next slide here, how that suction is created or how it's you know, described. Intrapleural pressure is subatmospheric. That's complicated language to sort of say it's the lungs get suctioned to the chest wall. That's really what that means. You have, and it's interesting, you have the intrapleural pressure that they talk about, it's here. And then they also talk about the intrapulmonary pressure and that's pulmonary. Whenever you see pulmonary, you refer to lungs. If you see the word plural, that gives you a hint that's part of that membrane system in the lungs. And, and this here is interesting to see because if we have, if we get a, a rib break, for example, and it pokes through here, pokes through that seal, we're gonna have air, external atmospheric air come in and that suction is decreased. And so the lungs deflate and don't get pulled at the chest wall. And so we have to re, you know, we have to suction that air out. Um, you can see that here, right in here with this, um, with this device and then bring the lungs back to the chest wall. So that's um, where that becomes, you know, critical. If somebody has a rib fracture that could do it or stabbing, or just if you have pneumothorax, we have fluid retention in the lungs as well. All right. Good. So that's for the lungs. The rest here, I think, is, is pretty much anatomy stuff that we, you know, we talk about the different lo lobes of the lungs that's on the term list. And then we talk about the different muscles. Well, we already covered the muscles. I don't really talk much about the respiratory volumes, um, but we can They're not that, you know, complicated. They're just big words at the end. But the, the, when you're sitting down and you're just breathing in and out and you don't do much, they call it a tidal volume. And that's about a half a liter of volume that's exchanged in the lungs each time. And then if you take a deep breath, you go all the way up, you, you in, you, you're, you're taking a normal breath in and then whatever afterwards you bring, bring into the lungs is called the inspiratory reserve volume. And then the other end of the thing is you, you breathe out really as heavily as you can and then that's the expiratory, expiratory reserve volume, they call that. And so all together here, you have what's called the vital capacity, which is the deep breath into the deep breath the full exha exhalation. So that's called vital capacity. Um, and then the only other thing we have is the residual volume at the end here. And the residual volume is the air that gets kept in the airways to keep them open. There's no, there's no exchange of, of oxygen. That's like in the ventilation zone. And so that's uh, what, what, what is this last piece here that's about a liter and a half. Um, of volume. But this part here is where we have um, oxygen exchange. So that's for that. And then that's about it for this chapter, I think. You guys have any questions to this part or are you pretty cool with them? You're all asleep. Hey, hello. Uh oh. Yes. There is somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you are so far so good <laughs> yes all right good so let's keep going to the digestive system um when we look at the digestive system i think one of the things that we kind of want to differentiate is is chemical digestion from um, mechanical digestion let's see where we go with that you're pretty cute huh so when we when we look at the the mouth, so the you know the digestive system is from the mouth to the butt, basically we gotta get food in and poop it out, um, and and absorb as much as we can in between. Um, so when we look at the mouth, in the mouth we have salivary glands, and they create saliva, which is when we look at the food, it 
uh, we chew the food and then we mix it with saliva. So the chewing is mechanical digestion and um, because we're, we're working it physically and then um, the uh, getting the saliva into the food is then chemical digestion because we, first of all, we make a little lubricating liquidy kind of semi-liquid bolus out of it that we can swallow. It's a little hard to swallow straight toes. That would be pretty rough. Um, but also the saliva contains amylase and amylase is the, uh, begins the breakdown of carbohydrates. So when you look at the term, where's the amylase? Is the amylase somewhere here? Here, when you look at the term amylase, you look at the ASC at the end. If you see an ASC at the end, you know it's an enzyme doing something. When you see an enzyme, it's very often it's like breaking things down, like helping with that process. Um, but I mean, it's breaking or making, but in chemistry, in, in the digestive system, you pretty much, which enzyme breaks down which food is what we talk about. So amylase is the starts the chemical digestion of carbohydrates. You have a few major food groups, um, and we're looking at, at carbs, proteins, and lipids when we look at the digestion. The, pro the, the carbohydrate starts in the mouth when it comes to chemical digestion. The protein starts in the stomach as it goes to um, um, chemical digestion, and then the fat, the lipids, start below that in the duodenum. Um, the for, so if we chew the food and then we, yeah, this is a pretty cool chart of all the stuff that saliva does. If you need to really go deep on it, um, it's it's certainly there. Uh, but one, what we, we, we move, we eat the food, we chew it, and then we swallow it. And I don't think I have questions on, you know, the different, the, the dental formula and stuff like that. That's just... Um, good to know what's you know what's where and then I like this slide because it shows you the the kids when the stuff comes and then when they you know the second teeth come so you can be prepared for that period in the child's life uh, or in in our life um, but then we get to swallowing and the swallowing is known as deglutition that's the act of swallowing so that's how we get uh, through alternating contraction of both the different levels of food. When we look at the when we look at the the, the, the the layers of the gut tube, where was that? We have do I have a picture of that? Well there we go, that's a picture. When we look at the layer of the gut tube, we have a muscular um, and you know this is wrong. This is smooth muscle. Do you see this? I wrote skeletal muscle. Did anybody think that might be wrong? There we go. That was my bad. Um, I wrote that, I read that the other day. I'm going like, where was I when I was writing that? But anyway, the muscles, that's pretty cool in here, is you got a muscle that's around the tube. This is the gut tube. So this is the lumen, the inside. And we've got all the mucosa, which is the, the epithelium, which is where we have chemical enzymes that digest it, but we also have food absorption. And then we get the muscular layer, muscularis. And so the uh, circular layer is on the inside and the longitudinal layer is on the outside. So what we could do with that, we can alternately contract those layers and bring the food forward, move it forward as we do that. So we contract the circular and then we contract the longitudinal and then that pushes it forward as we let the circular go and contract it further down the tube, that kind of stuff. So that's known as peristalsis. And I think you want to know that term. So the alternate contraction and relaxation of the two muscular layers facilitate the movement of indigest, ingested material. That's known as peristalsis. So that's pretty cool. Uh, when we look at the layers here further, we have the mucosal surface shows numerous longitudinal folds called rugae with tiny holes that open into gastric pits. So what we do here, we go to the stomach. I should say that that's the stomach. Yeah, sometimes my test review is not the best test review. But anyway, if you look at the stomach, we got these, um, um, these longitudinal folds here. So you open the stomach and it kind of goes these folds. These are known as rugae. And when you look deeper into the rugae, you get to these gastric pits 
and the gastric pits or long pits going down all the way to the um, to the next layer. But in those pits, what we have is we have different um, um, secreting uh, cells. We have a few of them, three main ones. We got a fourth one too. But the one that I want you to know is the chief cells are down at the bottom and they secrete hydrochloric acid. No, they secrete pepsinogen, sorry about that. That they secrete pepsinogen. And pepsinogen is the precursor of pepsin and pepsin uh, um, digests protein. And so what you need, so if you see the word G-E-N, pepsinogen, it's from the word genesis. So that's the creation. So that's like, a, you always think it's one step before it's finished when you see the GEM. So you got to transfer the pepsinogen into pepsin somehow. And what that, what, what, what that does is hydrochloric acid can do that. And so we have the parietal cells here, the second type of cells that are in this part of the gastric pit and they secrete hydrochloric acid. So now you get the, the, the pepsinogen coming out of the chief cells when they got food present that needs to be digested. It goes past the parietal cells, it gets activated, and now it's pepsin, and then it comes out in the top here. Uh, and the top layer cells are the mucus cells, and they create a protective mucus, which is necessary that the acidity of the hydrochloric acid is not too acidic that it eats everything up. Because HCL, if you put that on the skin, you burn a hole in the skin, it's that acidic. So it's pretty powerful stuff. And so that, but that's why these gastric pits are important. You might ask, why do we need, you know, why can't we just have peps and why do we need peps in a gen? And that's because we don't want the stomach to digest itself. Uh, we don't want the, 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 the protein digestive elements to be active when there's no food present. And so that's why we have that two step process there. So that's pretty cool. And then after, um, after the stomach, where we digest, um, protein, but also we do a lot of physical, you know, moving the food around that it gets into smaller and smaller particles, also mechanically. But then after that, we get into the small bowel, we get into the duodenum. And to duodenum, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, that's my texting sound. I don't know how to turn that off. Uh, the duodenum is also known as the 12 finger gut because it's 12 fingers wide. It embraces the pancreas and releases a lot of enzymes and bile into it. And so um, a lot of enzymes break down. Let's see, where's the pancreas? Is the pancreas come out here? Um, really? Where's my pancreas? There is my pancreas. So you see this, the, the pancreas is embracing, or the, the duodenum is embracing the pancreas. This is the pancreas. And so in the pancreas, we make, we remember we make insulin and glucagon in there. So we have some um, endocrine secretion, some hormones, but then also we make a lot of the digestive enzyme or most of the digestive enzymes in the pancreas. And then they get squirted right here into duodenum where they will work on all the macromolecules and break them down. Also, we get the bile gets squirted from the gallbladder where it is stored. It's made by the liver is made by the liver and it's stored in the gallbladder and stored and concentrated. And then it gets released into duodenum, to duodenum here too. And what bile helps is helps with, um, it helps us with breaking down the fat. It's kind of like soap when you, you wash your dishes and you got fatty pans and pots and you have, you know, warm water and and soap, and that breaks down the fat globule and it makes it smaller and smaller so you can wash it. And so it emulsifies the fat droplets and that's what the bile does. And so it emulsifies, it makes it smaller and smaller. Uh, um, and, and then the body can absorb it and it can get into the lymphatic system and get digested after that. And so that's kind of how, how the bile salts work. They, they have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic element. So they're kind of like a phospholipid bilayer without being a phospholipid bilayer, but they have some of these similar qualities and they can break down uh, food fat droplet and that's called emulsification as a process. Good, let's see, where was I with that? Um, <clears throat> so in the duodenum, much of the, K 
chemical breakdown happens. Um, and then, and so when we talk about that, we go to micronutrients, and those are monosaccharides, amino acids, fatty acids, and glycerol from the three major food net networks. And then when we look deeper into the gut um, structure here, you see you see these villi looking things, and here we go. That's the thing. And the inner fold of the submucosa makes inner folds, and 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 those enhance the um, uh, the surface area greatly. And in those inner folds, you have a blood network and you have a lacteal, so you can absorb all the. You, so first you break them down, and then you gotta absorb them. So um, the breakdown molecules are um, often on these microvilli here, so they're like velvety feeling. They're very fine little hairs that stick out that that can hold all these enzymes and wait for the food to come down and break it down and then you got the enterocytes which are which are the 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 gut cells the small intestine cells that absorb the food particles and they can then go through here and then they go into the blood vessel or as we look at the fats it goes to the lacteals and gets brought to the liver for processing through the cardiovascular system that way um, so that's kind of neat, I think. Here's the enterocytes, uh, what they do and how that, you know, gets transported. The food cells really come through and they get transported. Here it's the adipose, the fat stuff gets transported into the lacteals. And here these are peptides that get transported into the um, blood supply here in, uh, in the villi. So that's pretty cool stuff, I think. So that's the villi, container cap network lymphatic vessels. And then the enterocytes, I'm just reading the review, which are simple columnar epithelial. So you want to remember those points. Uh, they line the villus and then they display the microvilla, which is also known as the brush border enzyme, um, holding, holding the different enzymes. And then the micronutrients go through the cells, entering the bloodstream into lymph. Um, Water and salt is also absorbed through the microvilli, so that's important. And then the next thing, um, what that's not, I think what's important there is when you look at water and salt, it gets also absorbed further down because when you look at the small intestine, um, the first part here. You look at the small intestine, the first part is that the duodenum, there's a lot of the breakdown of the macro to micronutrients happens. And then you got the jejunum and in the jejunum, you, you, you um, do a lot of the absorption of the nutrients. And then as the uh, jejunum goes into the latter part, which is the ileum, you have less and less absorption um, and more and more Um, liquid and water absorption and food absorption. That's what I mean by that. And so uh, then we go towards the large intestine. In the large intestine, we really just have um, liquid absorption. And we also have, um, where was, where's the technical stuff? We also have good bacteria in there. So in this, uh, this structure, this is actually more the anatomy part. What we do in there, we have um, a lot of gobble cells in there, but you have these good bacteria in there and they decompose our indigestible food items before we get to poop it out. But they also are really important for us because they, they, they themselves have secretions that come out of them and they have a lot of activities that go on in us. And so you can actually trace back at this point people who are, let's say they have a bout of depression, it can be partly because some of their good bacteria, some of their prebiotics or biotics in the system are not present anymore. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, and we have so many of them. We have more good bacteria in us that we have our own cells. So one of the jokes I, I remember was like, you know, you have more foreign DNA in you than your own DNA which is kind of gross, but it's also important that we don't look at that stuff as gross, but understand, you know, how important that is. 
And so that's why I have that the good bacteria help decompose an indigestible food, but they also help free um, molecules that are necessary for us as humans, which is from, this is just later science. It's not in the textbook. Some of that is not in the textbooks yet. Um, and then after that, we, we have a thing on the pancreas. Uh, we talk about that before and, and the enzymatic, um, the digestive enzymes that come out of it is called the pancreatic juice and it gets secreted into the duodenum. So you want to remember that. And then the last point here is the liver and the liver is the largest exocrine gland that secretes bile, which helps us with the fat absorption, which we talk about. It, the liver the, has a lot of functions. If, if you ever have a test and you don't know all the functions or so, and you have a liver, you know, what does what, you, the liver is a good choice. Um, it helps us met metabolize carbohydrates and proteins and fats. It detoxifies us by inactivating medications and poisons. And then it also uh, makes, it synthesizes a lot of uh, blood components such as albumin or the clotting factor that we need when we do the blood clotting, which we talked about not that long ago. So it's pretty cool stuff um, in the liver. All right, and then the last part of this chapter basically goes overviews to different digestions. Um, and I just wanna get you, have, have you have an, an overview, uh, but I don't need you uh, to memorize all these different um, enzymes, but look at this lipase. We can figure out that that's probably has something to do with lipids. Uh, so that's, that's pretty good right there. You've got a few different ones. Um, amylase we talked about already, or disaccharidase, you know, disaccharide is a sugar. Um, and what about the, I guess that's with the peps in there. All right. And then the last slide. Yeah. I put this up because when we get, when you get into physio, it can get like a barrage of words, like lists of different enzymes that you have to memorize. And I, uh, wanna, uh, I wanna try to be able to group them in as much as possible for you. And so that's why I have some of these lists up here. But let's go through the urinary system. And again, if you have a question, you speak up. Oh, you know what I did not touch on, touch on but what's not on the test uh, is the nutrition chapter. Did you guys find that helpful? Did that teach you something? Yeah. Yeah? Good. Uh, and so I'm not really covering it, but in terms of the review, but um, I've, I, I find things like this, for example, very interesting, right? Uh, calorie and what is a calorie mean and then the differences. And so I, I want to, um, or the fact that this is, there's all these proteins in vegetables. And when I first, you know, originally it's like, yeah, meat is the protein part. Uh, but not necessarily only. And so that was pretty interesting uh, in terms of, of that. And then, of course, the sugar spike. I think we talked about that already in the chemistry chapter, um, how to not have so many sugar spikes. Um, and of course, lastly, but not leastly, is the fact how important, how important fiber is uh, for us, of course. I want to make sure you guys um, that always amazes me how fiber actually takes care of so much stuff. If we, if we, even if we just get, you know, made them useful, that's fine. Um, anyway, but from there, we can go right into the urinary chapter and work on that. Um, what's the main points of the urinary chapter? <clears throat> well, what it does, it, 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 it basically, you know, filters our blood um, and make sure we don't have too much crap in it. So it eliminates, um, uh, metabolic products it, it gets it gets it gets rid of stuff that are liquid substances uh, the digestive tract can get rid of of solid substances uh, the kidneys can get rid of uh, liquid substances that we need to get rid of the respiratory system can get rid of gases that we can breathe out and get rid of um, um, metabolic path meta, metabolic metabolites that way metabolic products um, also, the kidneys is important. It maintains an electrolyte um, concentration, and, and we talked about the acid and base balance, um, and also works on with the electrolytes. It also works on the osmotic pressure in bloody fluids, and that has to do then again how does the fluid 
from the capillaries feed back to the heart. It controls blood forming elements through uh, things like erythropoietin, which is an enzyme, a hormone that spurs on red blood cell production. So it sort of regulates blood pressure in, in that fashion. Um, it, it also regulates how much water do we pee out and how much volume of liquid is in the system. So it's pretty, it's pretty neat stuff. So uh, what I think the big one though, what we want to look at here is the, um, is the overview here. So when you look at the kidneys, let me find this here. The blood comes up into the kidneys and travels in between each of these um, upside down pyramids and then goes into these little globular things called um, glomeruli. Where is that? And so that's the artery bringing it in. And then a capillary goes into this glomerulus or the capillary tuft is actually known as the glomerulus. Um, um, and, and from there, and these are very, very leaky capillaries and the fluid all leaks in this surrounding structure known as the Bowman's capsule. And from there, all that filtrate about 170 liters a day, which is a lot. We better don't pee out that much. We pee out about a liter and a half. That's plenty. Um, but all that filtrate goes, gets squished out of the blood and goes into this tubular network. And the tubular network is kind of interesting because it, it's wiggly and then it has a long thing going deep into the kidneys and then it comes back out of the kidneys and then it gets collected and basically becomes urine at the end of the day. Um, and so in this section, all that filtered material gets most of the time brought back, reabsorbed into the bloodstream. So you see that schematically here. So you create a lot of filtrate and clean the blood that way by filtering it through the, through the glomerulus, but a lot of it gets reabsorbed into the um, capillaries again, into the cardiovascular system to maintain the blood volume, obviously, and not just rehydrate out. 170 liters, that'd be a lot of water to drink. Um, and then, but some of the stuff we can then also actively secrete from the bloodstream into the, into the filtrate to get rid of like metabolites and things like that. And then at the end of the day, we empty it and excrete it out through the bladder um, into the external environment. So what you want to know here is you want to understand the terminology from making a filtrate so the filtration is the first step from getting the blood supply to the glomerulus and squeezing that blood out into the tubular system. And that's filtration. And then from the tubular system back to the bloodstream, that's reabsorption, lumen to blood. And then from the blood back into the lumen, into the kidney tubules, that's called secretion because that's an active process. Um, and excretion is just when we pee it out. So that's kind of the clear one on that. So I need you to make sure you know those words. Um, I think for the practical part, I'm going to go through the anatomy afterwards. But let's see. We can, this is a pretty good shot for that. So you can see you have these arteries and then the vein. We talked about that coming in. They have all these little veins have different names interlobular, interarcuate, arcuate are the ones that call it's an arc, uh, interlobar versus interlobular. So, you know, don't get too mixed up with, with those terms for our class. But when we look at the kidney as a structure, we see the outside is known as the renal cortex. And then we have towards the inside, which is known as the renal medulla, we have these upside down pyramids. And these are known as the renal pyramids um, and there's three dimensional this kind of picture is pretty good showing the three dimensional part but then we bet into funnels and once we get the funnels they call them renal um, papilla first it's the tip actually of the pyramid and then um, the calyxes are the funnels themselves we got the initial ones the minor and then when they collect together get into a matrix calyx and then 
at the end they feed into a renal pelvis and that's where we collect the urine that goes down the ureter which then goes to the bladder where it's stored and then we pee it out through the urethra and that's the last part here so you got the urethra that comes from the bladder going out into the external environment um so that's the structural portions that I mean you know that the hilum you have a hilum oh that question came up in the lungs too i think somebody had it you but you have or you have structures going in and out of an organ we often call that a hilum um because you don't want to have you know you don't want to have uh, let's say the renal pelvis come out on the other side you don't want to have too many entry points and exit points into an organ and has a capsule around it and it's sort of protected and left on its own device to do their own its own work you want to have that be organized that one place you let things go in and out and often we call that a hilum all right so that's that we can briefly talk about this part here from filtrate to urine because what's interesting I think generally speaking, what's interesting about this process is the fact that sodium and water are very closely related. So water always follows sodium. And so you have, if you look at, if you look at, um, if you look at this long tubule up here, most of the stuff gets reabsorbed back in here. Most of the filter gets reabsorbed back in here. But as we go down to this loop of Henley, that's an anatomy term, we have the interplay between sodium and sodium and water get really strong. So we have sodium leaf get actively pulled out of the filtrate and water will follow it. And then you have blood vessels that are hanging around here. You got that picture that I show right here, this was a recta, they call that, he's hanging around, and the liquid then goes back into the blood stream um, from there and, and, you know, make sure the blood volume gets uh, not too low. So that's the loop of Henley, how that basically works there with waterfall salt. I think that's the main point that you want to take out of this process um, into the physiology, and then there it gets, you know, interestingly, a little more uh, complex, obviously. Good, so that's what I have in terms of the physiotype part. Did you guys want to talk about certain questions on the repro and embryo? Or you guys were pretty cool with those quizzes? I was pretty good with those quizzes. That was pretty okay. Yeah. So, because I'm, I'm not covering it on the test there, but I know that Natalie had a question on one of the questions, but she just can text me offline. Uh, can you tell her that, Anthony? Yeah, um, she told me about that. I don't know what question she had. She did mention though that she already messaged you. Uh, yeah, and we and we talked about working it through in the class today. But if she had something that come up, she just tell her she can text me, and we can go through it offline. For sure. Yeah, I'll let her know. That way, she can get those answered. Um, because then that's pretty much the main portion of the material from the physio perspective as it, well, physioanatomy, microanatomy, not the gross anatomy that we do in the lab portion. Um, and what I want to do now is I want to maybe go through and do an extensive, uh, maybe 20 question or so um, quiz a little bit to just get you guys uh, moving towards the end of the class on that perspective as well, because a large portion of the uh, of the final is is the terminology, obviously, especially since it's mainly an anatomy class that we're dealing with here. So I want to do that. You guys cool with that? Yeah. Okay. And again, if you have other questions to come up, just speak up. But if not, take out a sheet of paper. And well, can I ask questions on? other parts of, like not this booklet another booklet yeah absolutely especially uh, today and then the next session too when we kind of integrate everything well i was looking at page six uh of the ear and um the bottom picture i couldn't really make out the the malus incas and stapes 
So I was just wondering, because yeah. in the video you did it, but you're so far away in the video, I couldn't really tell. Mm -hmm. That's the neurology, right? And you're talking about the neurology booklet? No, these are the test review pictures that you posted. Oh, oh, got it. Yeah, let me go through that. Let me open that up. You can see that? Yeah. Yeah, these are, it's hard. So, um, the malice is the one attached to the eardrum. And the stapes is the one attached to the oval window. And then the one in between is the incus. That's as close as I get it in terms of visualizing it. But can you make that up, that out there? How that is attached to the... Yeah, I could see that. I just couldn't really tell. Yeah, no, it's... it's and, I'm, and I honestly, I will have to go back and look at my test questions. I'm not sure what I how I asked it on what I ask of it I can just tell you that I always try to be as clear as I can be and if it ain't clear I will give you the point is that good enough <laughs> yeah that's that's the only one that I couldn't really tell because it was so far away yeah it's a tough one it's a tough one and I think I added it later too and I I don't think I took the picture specifically for it but this year's the eardrum and so you see the first bone is right attached to the eardrum. And so that's the malice. And then you see the last bone is attached to the cochlear part, that stirrup looking thing. And that's, so that's the stirrup. I mean, that's the stapes. And then the one in between, you can see the joint line here is in red or whatever color that is. And then that's the incus. But I definitely would not ask you for the incus. I can tell you that much. If I would take one that's either attached to the eardrum or attached to the um, to the inner ear. All right. Yeah, that was good. Okay, good. So now take out a sheet of paper. I know it's a very big class we're having here. We'll do it together, and then others can watch it. Oops. Watch it later. So we'll just go from the heart downward. <clears throat> um, what I have there. So number one, give me, oh, I got to write this down too. Otherwise I don't know what I'm asking. I'm a little discombobulated here. So number one, give me, when you look at the aorta coming out, we have these three stumps. I want you to tell me the, what's the first stump here coming off of the aortic arch. Then number two, I want you to tell me what's this chamber called? Number two is this chamber. <clears throat> number three is this valve between this chamber and this chamber. What is that called? The valve here. Number four, when I look at this heart again, I got this vessel that comes down here in between those two chambers, this feeding the heart vessel. What is this one called? That's number four. And that's number four. Number five, I'm gonna do some blood stuff here. What's this blood vessel here called? Right blood cells, number five, with the pink background. Number six, 
And then number six, what is one of these little fragments called that's bluish here? And then number seven, let me know if I'm too hasty, okay? Let me know if I'm too fast. Number seven, we get to the brain. I like you to tell me this white structure that connects the two brain hemispheres together. What's that called? Number seven. And then number eight, I want you to tell me what is this egg-shaped structure called here in the center, number eight? <clears throat> and then number nine, I like you to tell me this is the cerebellum Above the cerebellum, I got these two dots. What is the top one called? The one superior. It's number nine. Number 10, when I look at the brain close to the other side, I see these two wiggles. One is reddish, one is bluish. What's the bluish one called? That's number 10. And number 11, we're gonna go through this model here. That's the space that's filled with CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. I want you to tell me what is one of these horns here called that's on each side going into the hemispheres of the brain, basically? That's number 11. <clears throat> and then number 12, I'm going to go to the spinal cord and I like you to tell me What's this yellow ball here on the side called? That's number 12. Number 13 is when I look at the gray matter on the inside, I got these, I don't know, this butterfly on the inside and these things bulging out a little bit. What's the one here on the side called? What do we call that? 13. And then we go to 14 and we go to this picture here. And you see down here in the, below the ribs, that's the ribs, below the ribs, you get it, this cord comes into a tip. What is that tip called? Number 14. And then we go to the eye, number 15. Oh, no, look at that. We got the year first. Let's do the year first. Number 15. Um, what is this thing here called? As the sound waves enter the ear, they hit this structure here. And that then vibrates. What is this structure called? Number 15. And number 16, I like you to tell me this snail house looking structure that's the organ of hearing in it. What's that called? Number 16. And then we get to the eyeball. And number 17 is, what's this structure here called that's on the outside of each eyeball? That's number 17.
Number 17 is the structure on the outside of the eyeball. Number 18, I like you to tell me a muscle that goes parallel, little, little, straight here from the front to the back on these same outside of the muscle that this structure is on. What is that muscle called? Number 18. And then number 19, I guess we go over 20. Number 19, I take the eyeball apart. What's this thing called here? That's behind um, the iris and the pupil that the light goes in and then has to go through. What's that called? That's number 19. And then number 20. We get to some loans. So let's see what we got there. Number 20, we have, yeah, what is this structure here called? That's a one single structure that goes up and down below the throat. What is that called? That's number 20. Number 21 is when you look at the different parts of the lungs here, what's this called here, this part? What's this part called here? 21. And then <clears throat> from there, Oh, tell me, actually, 22. Tell me what this structure here is called. It's a muscle. What is that called? 22. It's the one that helps us breathe. 22. And then number 23. Now we're going to get us to the digestive system. I would like you to tell me... Um... As we exit the stomach, we get to the first part of the small intestine. What's that first part of the small intestine called? That's number 23. Number 24, hugging that is a gland, which you can only actually see a little bit. Let's not do that then. Uh, number 24, um, I'd like to tell me what is this part of the colon called? I shouldn't have said that. Number 24. What is this part of the intestine called? Oh, did I not do any pictures of the kidneys? I don't think so. No, there they are. Good. All right. That was number 24. Number 25, we do a little kidney. And look there, they're even labeled. And I like you to tell me what is one of these darker structures called here that go, this is the cortex that go down into the medulla. What is one of those called? That's number 25. Number 26. Um, what is Oh, here, let's do one of these wiggles. What is this? So you got this little round thing and then you go wiggles, 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 and it goes down, it goes back up, wiggles some more. And then the two becomes this major one that brings the uh, urine, the filtrate, but then becomes urine down through the calyces into the ureter. What is that thing called right here? That's number 26. Can you uh, point to that part again? My bad. Uh, no, that's cool. Uh, that's cool. No, this long white thing that brings, you know, collect that brings the fluid down the the filtrate down into the calyces, and then it becomes urine as it goes to the bladder. Thank you. And I think that should be good for today with these twenty six things. That way we don't make it too long of a session. Although students have been watching these sessions amazing to me anyway so let's just stay right here what was number 26 and you just say it out whoever has it collecting duct 
Yeah, very good. Okay. Collecting dog number 25, one of these. Renal pyramid. Very good. And then when we get to the digestive system, I got 24 is this piece. The ascending. Ascending, colon, good. Then this we didn't talk about, this is the appendix. And I didn't, I want to just point that out that you know that that's what that is. We might do that next week. Um, and then we did this first portion that comes out of the stomach of the what, intestine, what's that called? Uh, I got, I was thinking duodenum. Yes, it's the duodenum. Yeah, and I'm not going to differentiate ileum and jejunum because you can't really, you know, that would be kind of mean. But we do have the gallbladder here. So that's the liver below. We have the stomach, esophagus. Um, and then we get to this question here, number 22. What was this muscle? The diaphragm. Very good. And then 21 is the lobes of the lung. Uh, I was a little unsure, but I I put down on my number for inferior lobe. I don't know if that was it or not. Though. It's the it's the middle. So you got a superior, okay. middle, inferior on the on the right, and on the left, uh, you're superior and inferior because you got the heart. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Sure. Makes Is sense. that why the left only has superior and inferior, and the right has the middle? Yes, it's because of the cardiac impression on the right on the left side. Uh. Yeah, you know, I'm not, not sure if it's reversed if the heart's on the right side, but um, that would be interesting to figure that out, actually. Could be. Should be. Um, then what's this one? Number 20. The windpipe. Uh, the trachea? Yes. The trachea is a windpipe here, and as soon as we split, we go to the bronchi. Right and left at that point. And let me see. Do I put down... No, I didn't put down the carina. Okay, that's cool. To see the splitting cartilage here is called the carina. And if an object comes down and it hits this bottom, that's when you have a violent cough. And if that ever happens, then you know your carina got activated. I'm sure you guys have experienced that too in the past. Anyway, number 19 is this structure. The lens. Yep. Number 18 is this muscle here by number 17 what's the muscle nobody is a, a lateral, lateral yeah, yeah that's yeah. what i'm gonna say <laughs> good 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 lateral rectus so you gotta if you look at these muscles you got so this is what what's this one that's number 17 lacrimal gland yeah, yeah so you always know that's on the outside and then you basically have four muscles that go straight from the front to the back. And those are the rectus muscle, the recti, lateral, superior, medial, inferior. And then you got the two more and you see one right here coming up and down at the bottom on the outside. That's the inferior oblique. And then you see on the medial side, you see this little white um, stalk coming out and that's the tendon of the superior oblique because the superior oblique is actually a muscle that goes around in a pulley and then it, it pulls the eyeball through that. And so you only see the tendon here uh, for that. So those are the six muscles of the eye, the external eye moving muscles that we need to know. And then we have the lacrimal gland and then um, <clears throat> we get to this snail part of the ear. What's that called? the cochlea that's the cochlea and as we hear the sound waves come through the external meatus and then they go into they vibrate this what's that called that's number 15. tympanic membrane the tympanic membrane very very good um and then we get to this structure here on the spinal cord right below the lip rib sorry that uh, comes to a tip. What is that tip called? The conus medullaris. So we have the conus medullaris here. We need a, we can point out the phyla, I mean the um, um, horse's tail, the cauda equina, 
that comes out below the cone uh, the conus medullaris, and then this little one in between going down that actually this arrow goes to is the phylum terminale, which I never point to that. That's really hard to identify on a model like that, I feel. Okay, that's the conus. And then we get to this part. So we looked at this bulge over here. What's that called? It's the lateral, lateral horn. Yeah, it's the lateral horn. So you got the, what's this, this yellow thing called? That was number 12. Dorsal root ganglion. Good, the dorsal root ganglion. And then you know, unless you could already tell that this is the back of the vertebra, but then you know this is the back of the spinal cord. The dorsal root ganglion is always on the dorsal, close to the dorsal side. So that's the posterior side. So you know that that's then the dorsal horn and that's the, vent, that's the lateral horn and then that would be the ventral horn. Um, and then <clears throat> those are the ventral roots, the dorsal roots. Um, you get that, right? These are all sensory information. This is all motor information. You get that, right? Yeah? Yes. Good. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. That's an important one to not, you know, as a how things kind of work fundamentally. And then what's the uh, what's what's this one called? Yeah, I didn't I didn't know this one. So this lateral ventricle. Okay, yeah, great. So this is the lateral ventricle. So when you take the brain, you see here, you see the space in here, and then you actually have a little space right in here. And when you look from the side, you can see there's a little groove in here. And then below here, there's more of a space. So these spaces are all filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And for us to study it, they made a model out of the spaces. And so this is the model. So this is the lateral ventricle on the left side. This is one on the right side. And then here's the third ventricle where you got a hole in the middle. And then you got this little stalk here. That's the cerebral aqueduct. And below it, where it widens again, that's that last part in front of the cerebellum, and that's the fourth ventricle. So those are all basically molded out of these spaces in here, right in here. Okay. I know that's a little bit of a weird model when you don't exactly know what you're looking at. Um, then we are going to, that was lateral ventricle. Then we go to the number 10, the blue wiggle. Post-central gyrus. Very good. The post-central gyrus. Um, and from there, I go to the dots above the cerebellum, the ones on top. Those are hard ones. Anyone? This is the superior colliculus. And then these are the inferior, it's the inferior colliculus or colliculi if you look from side to side. So um, that part of the terminology is not that relevant. Um, so that's that. And then we have the bulge here, this egg-shaped structure between on each hemisphere. Anybody get that one? Thalamus. Thalamus, very, very good. And then I pointed to this white part here that connects the two hemispheres with each other. What was that? Corpus callosus. Very good. Corpus callosum. Callosum. Um, <clears throat> that's a kind of a cool structure. I would start out. I think that's on every test because I like it. Uh, what's this cell called? That was number five. I think it's lymphocyte. It's a monocyte. The lymphocytes are these small ones here. Those are the lymphocytes. And then these are the monocytes. And then the other ones on the white ones have these granules. See these granules? And the way you differentiate those is you have some that have granules that sort of blend in with the background. Those are the neutrophils, like neutral granules, kind of the way I remember it. And then the bluish ones are basophils. And I kind of always think of basic being more bluish than reddish, I guess. Uh, and these are the eosinophils. And that's like neon to me as little bright orangey kind of dots. And so those are then the granulocytes. So those make up the five different lymphocytes. And obviously the red ones are red blood cells. And then the blue ones, what was that? That was number six. Anybody? Platelets. Yes, platelets. Very good. So those are those. 
And then from there, we got a couple more going on in the heart. So the last question there was, what's the artery that feeds the heart that goes down here on the interventricular mm -hmm. septum? What's that called? I, I guess the anterior descending artery. Yeah, it's the anterior descending artery. That's what I have as well. And then I know it's kind of a boring name, huh? Although I'm always grateful when the name kind of describes what it is, you know, that like helps them when it's just some random name. Um, then I wanted to know what's this chamber called? That was number two. Was the last one anterior descending artery yes. or anterior oh. descending right here? You can also find it as anterior interventricular some places. So um, that's the interventricular septum. But what I'm interested in is, is, you know, you have the right coronary come out of the heart here and then it splits right away. Um, no, sorry, the left, the left coronary comes out of the heart here, the aorta, and then it splits right away into the anterior descending and the circumflex that goes around the heart. And then there's all these small ones that we can all study, but, you know, that gives you a good starting point um, to then go more in detail if you need to. Good, good, good. That makes sense? Yeah. So then we have this structure here, this, this chamber. What's that called? Is that the right ventricle? That's the right ventricle. So we got a ventricle and we got a atria on top. And then we got the... Uh, or also here, vent atria ventricle. And then we got the valve that guards between the atria and the ventricle. And what's that one called? That's number three. Atrioventricular valve. Atrioventricular valve, exactly. So that's good. Then the other one will be the semilunar that's up here. We can see the other side where, where the left ventricle goes out this behind here, behind the back. And then the last question is, as the aorta shoots out blood from the left ventricle, it goes into the aortic arch and then it goes, feeds right out of three channels here. And what is the first one called? It's number one. Is it the, I don't know how this, is it the brachiocephalic trunk? Yes, brachiocephalic trunk, very good. And remember if we have a trunk and so, uh, like this here is also a trunk, pulmonary trunk, and then it splits right afterwards into pulmonary arteries. Same is true here. Whenever you have a trunk, you expect the vessel to split soon after it's called a trunk. And so soon after it's called a trunk here, um, it will go into the right, right. Subclavian Subclavian and the right, and the right. carotid. And on this, on the other side, on the left side of the body, because the heart's already a little bit on the left side, you have the left common carotid come out of here and the left subclavian come directly out of here. They don't have to split. So that's why we have three coming out, not four of these stones, if you were ever asking that. I was asking that at some point. That makes sense? Yeah. Good. So with that, I think we can... Uh, have some final thoughts um, of questions and and if that's helpful or suggestions and otherwise we can call it quits early if you want. The only two that I couldn't find on the heart diagrams was mm -hmm. the aortic semilunar valve and the inferior vena cava because I didn't know if those are going to be ones because I didn't see them on the diagram. Yeah let me go back to it real quick here. So, yeah, the picture I have it covered here, huh? I don't show the inferior vena cable. Um, and I think I only have vena cable on it. Yeah, yeah I don't worry about superior and inferior. Um, and then the other ones, the aortic semilunar valves are in the back here. So they are hard to see. I don't think I'm having them on the test because these are so nicely visible. And... Um, so I, so, so those would be, if I turn the heart around this way, you could see them from behind here. Okay. I think we have probably a picture in the book, right? I would think. Uh, I know what it looks like. I just didn't know if you're going to ask us, cause these are the diagrams for the test. So I just oh. wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I wouldn't, 
what's behind there? You know, <laughs> I, I wouldn't. And if I got that one on, you can definitely text me. WTF was that? <laughs> you know, then I, I'll change it. No, these, these, I, I try to make it as clear and disambiguous as possible. That's actually a reason why I don't put slides into my test because I always find those are often very difficult to interpret personally. I don't know. That was, that's been my most frustrating part of my um, anatomy course that I'm, I'm retaking sort of now to sort of see what the teacher is doing is all those slides that look all different. But anyway, we don't have to worry about that. Um, any other things? Last thoughts? Since these were the only question or pictures for the test that you gave us, does that mean that there's none, there's going to be no pictures on the reproductive organs? Very astute, yeah. <laughs> okay. No. Yeah, no. Uh, we have some pictures and we have some models in school where I was teaching, but I never thought they were really that great, uh, especially the ones, you know, we can have on the benches. And so it's just kind of like uh, lend itself to the last couple chapters were kind of not very do the homework and know it, but then to study between the last class and to study. Right now it's a little, you know, topsy-turvy because we're doing everything online, but that's kind of why I did that. So it's not like you go home on Wednesday and then, you know, by Friday you need to have these terms in your head. Very astute. So, good, is that it? You guys good? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, it's right. good. Crystal also, these terms yeah, getting, I'm good. getting a little easier. Yeah. So with that, you know, for, for now till next week, just especially if you're finishing up with your homeworks uh, in the, with your quizzes, just, you know, focus on the review, focus on the term list, go maybe back through the thing and look questions that you would like to understand a little bit better that we can talk next week about. Uh, but I, th you know, I think that is good enough for preparing yourself for the test. Good work, all you all. I have to do some grading to see if everybody's up to speed like you. But we'll see. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Oh, you have a good one. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. You too. Take care, you guys. Bye. Bye.